Well, hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jonathan Tepperman, Foreign Policy's Editor-in-Chief. I want to thank you all for joining us today for what is the relaunch of Foreign Policy's Her Power series. Now, our goal in starting the Her Power initiative about a year ago was to help amplify women's voices in international affairs. While the world has obviously changed in very dramatic ways since then, uh, the pandemic has only intensified the need to discuss gender in all of its different aspects as it relates to policymaking, as well as the differences in the ways the coronavirus crisis has affected men and women and the opportunities that it may provide to address longstanding injustices, improve governance both dom domestically and, and globally, and to come up with new, uh, more holistic and inclusive definitions of security and act on them. We have an excellent panel here today who are waiting in the wings to talk through all of this uh, for all of you. I'm gonna introduce them in just a minute, but before I do, I have two quick programming notes. First, I uh, wanna thank the Embassy of the State of Qatar in Washington, DC for partnering with Foreign Policy um, uh, for this installment of Her Power. Second, since we really want today's conversation to be a conversation, here's how you all can get involved. After I introduce them in just a minute, I'm going to ask the panel a few questions myself, but then I'm gonna start taking questions from all of you. There are two ways you can ask a question and you can start sending questions in right away. For those of us, or excuse me, those of you who are joining us via Zoom, just hit the Q&A button and a screen will pop up and you can ask questions there. Um, for those of you who are on phone or watching the live stream, please email your questions to events at foreignpolicy.com. And you can also send them in via social media using the hashtag uh, FPHerPower, all one word. Whatever technology you choose, please be sure to provide your name, organization, and location. <coughs> Excuse me. We're gonna do one more thing before we get started, which is to take a poll on what strategies you think should be emphasized as uh, the best way of increasing women's participation in politics and international affairs. A woman, uh, excuse me, a window should now appear on your Zoom screen and I want you to please select and submit your response. The question is, which of these do you see as the most powerful tool to advance inclusive governance and gender equality in political decision-making. One mandating greater gender equality in law or in constitutions. There are only eight countries in the world that currently do that. Two, using data to understand the very many ways gender inequality causes harm. And three, simply electing more women leaders. So you can send in your answers now and we'll tabulate them as soon as you're done. I'll just wait a minute for the answers to come in and we'll share the results and then we'll keep going. So there are the results, I hope uh, you all can see them. Um, or at least all of you on Zoom. The uh, first choice was electing more women leaders. That got 45% of the vote. 38% of you chose mandating greater equality uh, by law. And 17% suggested or uh, chose using data to help paint uh, a clearer picture. Okay, with that as background, now let's get to the good stuff. I I'm gonna introduce our very distinguished and very patient panelists. Thank you all for waiting. With us today, we have uh, Her Excellency Lola al Khatter. Um, Lola is assistant, is assistant foreign minister and spokesperson for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, of the state of Qatar. Next, we have uh, the indomitable Democratic Congressman uh, Lois Frankel, who represents South Florida in the House of Representatives, where she is, among many other things, co-chair of the Democratic Women's Caucus. Joining us from Ottawa is uh, Jacqueline O'Neill, Canada's first ever ambassador for women, peace and security. 
And finally, we've got Ambassador Roya Rahmani, who is Afghanistan's ambassador to the United States in Washington. Panelists, please unmute and turn on your video now. Thank you, it's, it's great to see you. Um, so uh, since we've got four countries represented on the call today, I wanna start by asking each of you to give us a very brief, very brief snapshot of the pandemic's current status in your country today. How is your um, country doing in, in the fight against COVID? Um, the particular burdens you see it placing on women there and what worries you the most going forward. Um, let's start with Congresswoman uh, Frankel because uh, I'm sure there's lots to say about Florida right now. Well, first of all, thank you uh, to Foreign Policy Magazine for having us here. And I'm so happy to be with my with this esteemed panel, just to let you know that I have been in all your countries and I, I value my uh, experience there. Uh, so you want to start with the sad story first, I guess. I'm or afraid one of so. the sad stories. Look, uh, I think it's it, to me. I I it pains me to say this, but you know, the United States leads the world in the number of cases and number of deaths. Um, over 3.8 million cases right now, almost over 140,000 deaths, and unfortunately, it's climbing. Very high positivity rate. Just to give you an example, my home state of Florida which has now been described as one of the epicenters of this disease and actually have more cases than most countries in the world, our positivity rate is over 18, is about 18%. And it's even worse in Arizona where the positivity rate is 23%. So it's a very sad story here. Just, uh, we opened too quickly. We didn't put, follow CDC guidelines. I could go into all of that, but how is it affecting uh, women. Obviously, our healthcare system is being strained. There are a lot of women on the front lines. Uh, children are out of school. Daycare is closed. And what we see, uh, most daycares all over the country are closed. And what we see is almost reverting back to uh, the past, where women are having the burden, really, of having to homeschool the kids, watch the kids, give up their job, if there is a job, uh, to take on those responsibilities. We have seen, uh, obviously, with people in cl close quarters and stress, the incidence of domestic violence increasing. Uh, and now the new battle is opening schools. And we see mostly most of our teachers are women. So they are now at the forefront of, of the new battle in our country. So uh, we have a lot of work to do here. And I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. That's not easy for a member of Congress to do, so I appreciate it. Um, Lola, give us the, the picture from Qatar and um, how, how the differences and how it's affecting men and women there and what worries you the most. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for inviting me. Uh, and it's very really good to see you and to be part of uh, this panel with the distinguished uh, panelists. Uh, Qatar, as you know, is a small uh, state. Uh, however, the uh, uh, fatality rate um, in uh, Qatar uh, is considered one of the uh, lowest, uh, luckily, at the global level. Um, Qatar, alongside uh, Singapore, uh, New Zealand, are considered the lowest uh, countries in terms of losses and in lives. Um, we have passed our peak. We had our peak uh, that started uh, late May throughout June, uh, up until the mid of uh, July, but we've passed it. Uh, everyone is talking about a second wave, not only in Qatar, but globally uh, as well. Um, in general, uh, we have a very good uh, health uh, system, who's led by, by a woman, by the way, our uh, health minister <laughs> as a woman. Um, how are women affected? Actually, in, in Qatar, I should say that in terms of patients, uh, more than 70% of them are males rather than females. And I think this uh, reflects the uh, global uh, numbers and percentages uh, as well. However, just like the um, uh, Congresswoman uh, Franklin mentioned, that the burden of homeschooling uh, and the other responsibilities are mostly borne by, by women in general. We have just uh, started a four-phase uh, plan to ease the restrictions, and we're expecting that schools will open uh, again in September. So we'll see how this is going to uh, play out. But all in all, it's 
now under control of Qatar. Excuse me, I was muted. Jacqueline, um, what do you, what's the, what, how do things look from Ottawa? Excuse me. They're looking better. We're still watching a lot of hot spots and areas of concern, including you know, seniors care facilities, et cetera. Uh, we've had a total of about 8,800 and some deaths. And fortunately that number is decreasing. We're in a number of provinces. We're moving up the scale of phases of opening, but there's still a lot of focus on our schools gonna be opening and, and is that an issue? And of course our border is still closed with our biggest uh, trading partner and closest friend, the United States, which is having a big impact. And you know, we've been from the beginning uh, doing what we call gender-based analysis plus on the crisis. So we've been trying to use data as the tool suggested to identify the differential impacts. And there are a whole range of them, a number of the same ones that my colleagues just mentioned. Uh, we identified some early stage impacts. And then now we're looking at things like our men and women accessing benefits at different rates and how are they taking advantage of some of the opportunities that are prevent, presented by the government and our, uh, you've probably heard this term, but our, our deputy prime minister was using the term, you know, in, in 2008, we called it, we had a recession and at the time she called it a he session because most industries hit were manufacturing, construction and other ones that are predominantly men. This one, uh, this potential recession hits women, uh, the most service industries, you know, retail, hospitality, et cetera. And our, our uh, deputy prime minister is using the term trying to prevent a she session. So that's one of our top areas of focus right now. Now, as, as Jacqueline knows, um, but not everybody uh, else does, um, I'm actually Canadian American and I come from a city called Windsor, Ontario, which is a manufacturing town, but is also an agricultural town. And Windsor has been in the news lately because it's having um, something like um, the same problem that that Singapore has suffered through where the there are a lot of migrant farm workers in Windsor and they have been disproportionately affected. Is that something you're seeing elsewhere in Canada as well? Absolutely, yeah. There's a huge focus right now on migrant workers to ensure, number one, that they're able to get tested, they're living in safe conditions, and that those who are sick don't fear repercussion if they do report it or report unsafe working conditions. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a big area for the government at the moment. Well, thanks, Jackie. Um, uh, uh... Let's look out, go to, to uh, Washington. Um, Roya, um, tell us about things in Afghanistan at the moment. Greetings to you and uh, the distinguished panelists and uh, all viewers here. Uh, in Afghanistan, I would like to start by saying that all our existing problems have not gone away when COVID arrived. So it, it exacerbated everything that existed from poverty to conflict to uh, violations to much more that we have been already dealing with. Uh, there is one characteristic that everybody agrees on with, uh, with COVID or many other crises, and that is that it affects the vulnerable the most. And who are the most vulnerable? Especially in countries like mine, it's they are the women. The women are, uh, because they, are, they have a lot more vulnerabilities in many uh, aspects that Congresswoman Frankel counted, they are affected a lot more, whether it is poverty or loss of job or caregiving or childcare, uh, gender-based violence, you name it. So uh, all of this has been exacerbated for women in addition to have being all those men who don't have jobs and they are at home. Um, you can imagine what that means. Um, so, um, uh, this, the impact of it is, of course, uh, and, uh, has been much greater for women than it has been for men. But moving forward, um, I'm looking at what are the long-term impacts of this coming from a co country that is affected and it's, it is still having an ongoing conflict. Um, the uh, impact of any crisis exacerbates our two other biggest problem, which is conflict, terrorism, and economic development or slowing down of it. So uh, that, is, that is the biggest impact that I would be worried about, about uh, the experience of all these children uh, who are um, uh, suffering from uh, even more intensified poverty uh, and conflict in a situation that social distancing cannot even be possibly imposed uh, because 
uh, we come, uh, I come from a country that has a poverty rate of over 55%. Uh, uh, that means most people are day wagers. So they have to choose between going hungry or uh, being exposed to the disease. Um, so um, all in all, uh, of course, the impact of it has been huge and particularly much more greater on women. Thank you. Lola, I want you to start the next question. Um, you know, many people have now observed on the fact that uh, countries with female leaders seem to have handled the crisis better than the rest. Um, but of course, it's a small sample size. Um, what do you think is behind this? Is this just coincidence, um, correlation rather than causation? Um, or if it is indeed causation, um, what's your theory? What explains why female-led countries seem to be doing so particularly well during this crisis? Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. I mean, in the recent years, more and more people started talking about uh, the role of women and, and governance in general and in leadership uh, positions. Now, historically speaking, um, leadership in general has been almost always associated with certain characteristics, such as uh, coercion, uh, authority, uh, power. Uh, all are traditionally associated characteristics with uh, masculinity in general. Um, if you go back even in the literature, Hobbes, Leviathan, uh, Machiavelli, the prince, right? All of these um, notions of power and sometimes even unethical power where the uh, uh, ends justify the means, etc. And this has been the dominating thesis when it comes to leadership and governance in, in general. Yet in the past decades, we started introducing new terminology to the leadership literature, such as ethical leadership, moral leadership, compassion, care, and so on and so forth. But only in recent years did we see actual real life examples. Now, to your point, whether this is a correlation or a causality, that's a good point. And uh, to answer it, we need not only a small sample size as we described it, but more and more empirical studies. However, as a first impression, I would say uh, that those examples happen to be women, uh, yet the characteristics themselves, such as compassion and care and morality and so on and so forth, are not necessarily exclusive to women. Although traditionally speaking, we have been always um, attributing these characteristics to femininity in general, just like we attributed in the past notions such as authority and force to masculinity in general. So it could be a man or a woman, but the characteristics themselves are mostly associated with femininity. The point here, uh, in my opinion, Jonathan, is that we need to build on this notion and build on the sense that not only with power can we achieve results, but also with compassion, also with more morality, also with more ethics at the leadership uh, level. And this is the paradigm shift that we're seeing with the likes of the Prime Minister of New Zealand, for example, and uh, others. I, I hope that this answers at least part of your question. Thank you, it does. Uh, Jacqueline, I'd like you to pick up on this. Um, do you think, does it make sense to talk about a distinctly female or feminist approach to public health? And since um, you're talking to Foreign Policy Magazine, I have to ask, is there a distinctly feminist approach to small f, small p foreign policy? And uh, to make this even more complicated, how do you emphasize that without essentializing gender difference, which is such a double-edged sword as Lola um, was gesturing to. Yeah, Thank I mean, you're right. It, it can be a bit of a minefield to walk this and to make some points in it. And I, for that reason, I'm often uh, a bit reluctant to focus on individual women leaders. You know, I, I'm, I'm grateful and I'm delighted about the attention generally, and as you said, the intensification of attention to women and gender in the, in the crisis. 
but sometimes people still hear it, I think, in, in zero sum terms. So a woman is good at something, so therefore a man is not, or there isn't a role for men, or women are better, and men are worse, et cetera. So that's one thing. And then the bigger concern, and, and that I often have is it discounts the importance of the system or the environment around them. And that's what we're trying to focus on in Canada right now, both, both domestically and internationally, is to build processes into government so that we are less dependent on individual leaders. And to answer your question, yeah, I do believe that a government and a set of policies can have a feminist perspective. And, and you know, that means a number of things. So domestically in Canada, we've had a practice of using for about 25 years what we call gender-based analysis that I mentioned in the, in the beginning. And it's just a tool to collect data and understand how issues affect men and women and boys and girls, people of different abilities, sexual orientations, et cetera, differently. So it's not saying the essentializing argument that women are, insert any sentence you want to say, but different policies affect men and women and boys and girls differently. And so we have to understand that as a tool. And then understanding that is not enough. You actually have to proactively want to change that and to reduce inequality. So we have in Canada what we call our feminist foreign policy. And the idea is that all people, regardless of their gender, should be able to access their rights uh, and that doing so, everybody's actually better off. It's not just something for women or by women. And during the crisis in particular, I think it's, it's resulted in a number of different ways of looking at it as Canadians and as men and women leaders, right? So of course, not only women are expected to carry a feminist foreign policy, but the having one has resulted in this crisis and us starting from a point of understanding that there is a gender dimension to everything. And that includes a pandemic. So it's all the issues that are my colleagues just, just listed, but we didn't have to waste weeks and sometimes months of going to decision-making tables and saying there's, we need to collect more data. We need to watch for something. We knew from the outset because we've been collecting data on basically everything else that it would happen. You know, second, it meant that we knew we had to listen a lot more carefully to local organizations, locally led, in particular women led organizations, because many of them were pivoting their work from doing whatever else they were focused on to basically being frontline healthcare workers and providing services where either multilateral organizations or national governments had failed. And the other thing it meant is, is a little bit of what Ambassador Roya was speaking to at the beginning, but when you take a feminist perspective, you're getting a whole range of input. So what that means is you're not only focused on the immediate urgent crisis at hand. As, a, as a, one of our ministers says, you, you, we have to avoid having tunnel vision. So part of this feminist foreign policy is looking at secondary and tertiary effects. So just to end with an example, you know, we know that it's affecting access to education. Nine out of 10 kids in the world are out of school. Girls are less likely than boys to go back. So we know that's an issue, but what are the surrounding implications of that? Well, we're seeing increased recruitments of boys and girls into extremist groups. So that becomes a piece in the security issue. We're seeing increased violence in the home against uh, partners, in, including children. We're seeing the inability of many women to return to the workforce because they, can't, they have to stay home. We're seeing increases in early enforced marriages. So UNFPA says we might, be, we might see an additional 13 million cases of child early enforced marriages over the next decade. And we're seeing a lot of LGBTI youth not being able to access basic health care because they don't have systems where they feel safe doing so. So it's the idea of breaking out of these silos and that's really a core part of having a feminist approach to foreign policy, which goes beyond the essentializing and saying we just understand that this is dynamic and we need a lot of inputs to make policy. Thank you. So I want to bring you in now, Congresswoman, because you've spent so many years working to get women more involved in policymaking. Um, the summer issue of Foreign Policy magazine, um, which just came out, is devoted to exploring the ways that the current crisis may create opportunities to address longstanding structural problems that just couldn't muster enough support uh, for change in ordinary times. We call this the Lemonade Project, um, figuring out how to use um, the crisis to our advantage. Could this be one of those issues? That is, do you think the, the COVID crisis could finally help drive action to right gender imbalances in the US? Well, first, thanks for that question. I, 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 let me say this, I think diversity is very important. Uh, whenever you get sit at the table to try to solve problems. So it's not 
it's gender diversity, of course, is part of it. But obviously, wh whether it's age or race, ethnicity, th these are all very important factors. And I will say that, uh, you know, in the House, uh, the, the Congress, the House, uh, we have incredible diversity. More than 60% of our members are either women, LGBTQ, people of color. It's a very, very diverse body. And what you see coming out of it is very progressive leadership and uh, to me, very, very responsive to the masses. Uh, and we actually have led the way in our response to COVID. Uh, if, you can, if you look at what the House of Representatives ha has done. So I think that's just a very good living example of diversity works. Now, here's the thing. Uh, I cannot, is COVID gonna be a way to boost women? I don't think so, uh, cause I don't think COVID is boosting anything in this world. Uh, but I will say this, if you look at American politics in 2018, it was a surge of women who won. And in fact, we were able to change the uh, party in power because of the advancement of women. So I do think in that regard, uh, uh, women today, especially in our country, uh, and a lot of it has to do uh, with the leadership of our president. I'm not gonna try to, uh, I could spend all day if I talked about that, but I do think what we've seen is a reaction. And uh, the reaction has been to trust women more. That's exactly what's happened here. Thank you. Roya, as you've already spoken to, women face particularly difficult challenges in Afghanistan, and um, the COVID crisis has only made things worse by accelerating or intensified all these pre-existing pro problems. So what are the prospects today? Um, how optimistic uh, are you about the possibility to, of increasing um, uh, gender um, or, or addressing gender imbalances in today's Afghanistan, especially given the way the US Taliban peace deal has legitimated the Taliban as a force, in, a political force in Afghanistan. And, and what, what are the, the strategies that you think should be emphasized um, to help Afghan women play an appropriate uh, equal role in, in the country's political structure and policymaking in general? Well, thank you. I will start by sharing a quote, and that is that pessimism is the uh, instrument of the powerful. I cannot afford it. Um, so uh, I have to be, and we have to be hopeful. Uh, we have been through enough that we cannot really uh, uh, afford uh, to be pessimistic because there is uh, so much happening that hope is the only thing that we really need to hang on to. So I would say I am continuing to be hopeful and continue this struggle because this is the only way out. It's not that we have any other option and choices. We, it would have been nicer if it was easier, but it's not. So um, that's, that's the, the uh, first uh, part uh, of your question, I would say. And I could, I could talk a lot more if you, if you wanted on the, on the prospect of the peace process and the impact of it um, and how we are seeing that. But in terms of uh, to be more forward looking or future looking uh, about the strategies, I, I would uh, uh, call out, uh, out on everybody and say that the, uh, primary strategy for everybody, not only for Afghanistan, is to listen. Like, whether it is this situation of crisis or not, this situation of crisis probably does provide an opportunity that we do need to listen more and listen to the women, not just bring us pres uh, prescriptions of what needs to be done. Uh, and, and this this could be a, a way forward, but more specific strategies uh, would be uh, to provide opportunities uh, for women to access positions. We just spoke about how women did better in the positions of the leadership in the countries that they were leading uh, uh, in terms of managing these crises. But uh, 
and uh, we also saw the result of the uh, very quick survey that you took. And I was very pleased with the answer uh, because uh, I, I saw that what I voted uh, for got 45%. Uh, so uh, it is because of that opportunity. The, uh, unless women are given the opportunity to demonstrate to lead as much as difficult as it is, it, there wouldn't be uh, laws that would make a difference or moral would make a difference and whatnot. I think the sobering fact is that one of the data points that I saw that uh, the way the world is going, it would take us 100 years to reach gender equality around the world, 100 years. Do we really have that time to wait? Um, the, and as well as for economic, uh, 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 economic equality, uh, it would take 59 years at the pace that we are going today, which is quite sobering and quite disappointing. But again, I do not want to uh, focus on what is disappointing. And I want to go back and say, what are the opportunities? So access to the positions. Next key point, the women should be, uh, uh, there should be opportunities to do that. In Afghanistan, President Ghani has taken uh, like very brave and amazing steps towards that. He, his recent uh, uh, decision was that for every uh, one of the 34 provinces of Afghanistan, all deputy government uh, governors must be women. It must be a woman. The, the, he at least imposed certain number of uh, cabinet members to be women. Uh, while quotas are complicated, but they provide a, a opportunity for women presence to become normal. And the other strategy is to, to push for fair and equal judgment of women. As much as the bar for women to get to position is really, really high, but when they do get the position, they are judged so harshly. So, uh, the, well, first of all, as women, we judge ourselves very harshly. We are a lot more difficult than men are, but then also the society, the infrastructure, the whole system hard, judge us a lot more harsher. Uh, other uh, strategy would be upholding the workplace uh, policies to discourage harassment. And this is a very discouraging phenomena and it exists all over the world. And my country is of course no stranger to this. Uh, fair and uh, relevant compensation. I am specifically using the relevant compensation. Women need support for childcare. Women need uh, specific uh, ways uh, of support in order to be able to work and prove themselves. And um, uh, lastly would be the encouraging and, and encouraging environment. And I will just make two specific points regarding that. And that is to be a party in decision-making, not just the, a nicety to be at the table. Uh, and that goes also to your question regarding the peace process. And as well as uh, um, fair and equal uh, recognition and uh, not only that women should be just pleased to be there. Um, uh, I, I, I think uh, that's also very important. Last, uh, my last point would be the, although there is so much negative happening with COVID, the one thing I think somewhat it is flattening, I, not probably so much in my country, but probably in other places that I'm seeing is that the social and semi-formal platforms of networking that was so much male dominated where a lot of important decisions are, were solicited now become uh, a little bit more accessible to women because it has moved to on online space. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, we're now about halfway through our program. So I wanna open up the floor to questions from our audience. Before I do though, we're gonna take one more quick poll to see how this discussion thus far has affected your feelings about these issues. This time our question is, um, and it should be popping up on your Zoom screen momentarily, what are the chances that the pandemic will lead to meaningful global change and actually improve gender equality in politics and society? And we mean this not directly, but indirectly in the, the terms that um, Congresswoman Frankel was speaking about in uh, a few minutes ago, where you know the crisis or the the and, and the government's poor response to crisis could lead to, for example, in the United States, a wave of even more women getting elected to Congress and to high office. 
um, as people reject uh, the status quo. How optimistic are you uh, or pessimistic that you uh, are going to see um, that kind of change? It's a binary uh, question actually, optimistic or pessimistic? Please go ahead and vote. As I suspect everyone has voted and we're just waiting for the answer, I'm gonna say, um, uh, as we move into questions from the audience, just to remind you, uh, if you're on Zoom, you can submit your questions by hitting the Q&A button. Um, you can email your questions to uh, events at foreignpolicy.com, or you can post them on social media. Uh, there's our answer. 63% optimistic, 38% pessimistic. That is pretty impressive. We should have taken this poll at the beginning of the conversation too, to see how the discussion had changed things. Um, just one last note on questions. Uh, when you send them in, please give us your name, occupation, and location. The um, first question is from uh, Gitanjali Moore. Um, and uh, Gitanjali asks, what is being done in your respective countries to work on the harmful impact, uh, domestic violence, loss of income, lack of access to internet, et cetera, et cetera of COVID on uh, women and children? Um, uh, we just heard from um, uh, this about the situation in Afghanistan and what the Afghan government is doing to address it. Um, let me uh, bring it back to uh, Congresswoman Frankel and ask her uh, what she and uh, the Democratic caucus in the House are doing about all this. Well, keep in mind that we have a very split government. And so what, you know, the policy we bring forward, we then have to uh, argue with the, with the Senate and the president about this. So, you know, it's interesting because I, sadly, I voted uh, the pessimistic approach only because this, this is, this is my uh, big concern because I, I spend a lot of time uh, working on these issues. And thank you, these panelists have really expressed very well a lot of the challenges facing women. And uh, I, I sit on the uh, appropriations committee that funds uh, uh, both healthcare in this country and then healthcare across the globe in, in the foreign operations uh, subcommittee. And so what we have tried to do is respond to COVID by obviously putting more money into healthcare and testing and uh, not only here in this country, but across uh, the globe. Uh, I will tell you though, uh, the, one of the biggest obstacles uh, that I have seen and again, I'm sad to say this, I'm sort of mad to say this, is been the policies of our president that has uh, really put an obstacle in terms of women really getting full access to reproductive care. And I will specifically even talk about the global gag rule uh, without even talking about abortion. Uh, but it, what the policies here are preventing women from actually getting access to real health care whether it is contraceptive care or being treated just for you know, ordinary illnesses. And so I've see, I see that happening and that's, that is a real obstacle now. And, and then the other thing that concerns me is that uh, when you look at some of the issues that some of my, uh, the panelists have raised, whether it's child marriage or it could be genital mutilation or laws in countries where don't allow women to own property, uh, uh, I'm sure the folks in Afghanistan are worried about a setback on women, uh, the girls going to school. And I think of these issues of getting girls more educated, getting them healthy, getting them in positions for women to have more economic empowerment, to deal in the security uh, uh, issue, because uh, we know that women play such a big role in terms of either preventing terrorism or being part of it. And so, all these issues, which were really uh, for myself and for many members of my Democratic caucus, were front and center issue, have uh, I just see that the, this whole uh, COVID pandemic across the world is, in a sense, now become the new roadblock because you can't. It's it's uh, uh, you know, how do you deal with some of these issues, uh, whether it's 
uh, changing laws so people women can own more property or you the you may raise the issue of child marriage uh, somehow now you're having to fight uh, poverty even more and more so you have all these issues that have been activated by covid and i see that to me is uh, a real a challenge now Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring in a question from uh, Dr. Mohammed Nazir in Pakistan, who asks about um, the stigma that women face um, uh, in joining public life in certain countries, many countries, and what are the best strategies for dealing with that? And, and I'm going to pose the question to um, uh, Ambassador Rahmani and, um, and to Lola al Khadr, um, because you both come from um, what can be called in crude shorthand uh, traditional cultures or countries with a strong um, traditional uh, 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 culture um, and cultural mindset among a large sector of the population. What is the best way in your mind for starting to address these social norms? Is it by putting women, getting women into positions of power because that will start to affect the norms or do you address the norms first and hope that that will lead to greater female participation? Or do you do everything at the same time? Um, Roya, let's start with you. Sure. Uh, well, um, I would straight answer that women should be put in the position of power so that it would normalize their presence. It would normalize the society to see them more, to see their abilities. And I actually would also add that while I am saying this, I feel bad for those women who will be the first runners uh, because they will have to uh, uh, bear huge sacrifices. But that is uh, the space that they will be opening uh, in order to address this stigma. Uh, unless people see it, they don't believe it. So the way to see it is to put them in the position of power, let them perform, and uh, although they are going to be very judged very harshly, uh, they could still prove themselves. And this is something that I have seen over and over in my country. Um, I also have one more thing uh, to add uh, to this, and that is there is a very interesting paradox that is coming out of the research that shows that in the situation of crisis, women leadership usually uh, uh, seems to be more effective and needed. But on the other hand, the support for women leadership goes down. So um, there was a survey uh, between 2015 to 18, and they, and they looked at the 50,000 companies, and they found out that uh, the shareholders voted a lot less for women to be uh, board members when the company was not doing well. While when the company was doing well, that, that uh, tendency was increasing. So the bottom line is women get to be blamed for everything. And therefore, uh, it is important to show while they get the blame that they can do something about it too. Thank you. The next question is for Jennifer Burge, who's a business coach in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, and uh, Jacqueline, I'm going to direct this one at you because I think um, it goes right to your job description. Um, Jennifer asks, what can women in more economically advantaged countries like Canada and the United States do to support women um, who are um, suffering from domestic violence uh, and related problems in developing countries? So what can women um, like you in countries like Canada do to help women in, uh, in less... Um, uh, in, in poorer countries, um, other than simply uh, raising uh, awareness of the issue? You know, the, the more I work on these issues, the more I believe very strongly that your domestic and your international policies have to be profoundly consistent. And that I think even in the space that I work in, it's called women, peace and security. It's the idea of women being essential in preventing conflict, resolving it, et cetera. The, the kind of dirty secret of the space is that there've long been two types of countries that work on it. There's been the so-called global north that focuses on it as a foreign policy issue or as a defense issue. And then there's the global south that focuses on it internally, reforming its own police, military, internal structures. 
And over time, we're seeing a coming together of those because we really can't focus externally unless we not, it doesn't have to be either or, but we must do both simultaneously and not see women's inclusion externally as separate from women's inclusion in our own countries. And, you know, I just, to the, the Lemonade Project question, which I love, because I think it's deeply related to this, uh, and it's something I'm, I'm obsessed with at the moment is trying to figure out how to, these optimistic ideas can come, come through. We're seeing two really big dynamics right now. We have a pandemic, then we also have a global reckoning on racism and in particular anti-black racism and more of a conversation that's happened anywhere else. And that really has hit home much more, more intensely than any other kind of global discourse that I felt. And so I think that between the pandemic and the conversation about racism and the degree to which racism has impacted our thinking individually, but most importantly, our, our systems and is infused in that, it's got to change the way that we perceive both our own vulnerabilities as well as working abroad. So in Canada, one of the very first things uh, and areas we funded in response to the pandemic was domestic violence, recognizing that this is a problem domestically and every single country in the world that tracks this has, has an increase in domestic violence. So it's not only an international, it's not something affecting only somewhere else, uh, but it affects us too. So I'd say that the focus on the international versus domestic, I'm, I'm more and more focused on ensuring that every single one of our policymakers, like uh, the representative, the Congresswoman, gets both how it affects us domestically and that it's international. And in, until we have that consistency, uh, we're not gonna get as far internationally uh, as, as uh, Jennifer might have uh, wanted through her question. Thanks, Jacqueline. Um, Lola, I'm very sorry. I realized I just skipped over you. You were I was going to bring you in on the last question, um, and then I went uh, right to the next question. Um, to remind you, we were talking about um, how to address the stigma that women face in conservative societies when they try to get more involved in public affairs, um, and what the best approach is. Uh, what do you think? Thank you so much, uh, Jonathan. Actually, my question I want to address two two parts of of, of that uh, issue. Uh, and the experience of Qatar, it was very simple. It was a top-down uh, led process. Uh, leading by, by example, uh, we had uh, our first uh, lady leading uh, or paving the path uh, for the next generation. But then the wider issue that I want to address here is the idea of having stigma and conservative societies and uh, I think at the background of, of uh, your mind, probably Jonathan, the mind of, of uh, the, uh, the, the person who posed this question, is also Muslim um, uh, women in general. And here I want to address the wider issue about Muslim women, the reality, and the images about Muslim uh, women in, in general. I think this is one of the contested issues, and it's a very loaded issue that embeds uh, and carries a heavy legacy of what, what's uh, called the progress paradigm, a paradigm that we have inherited from the 19th century concept of modernity, a concept that assumed that the movement of history is a linear process that is progressing forever. And this unidimensional world you can only progress or regress, which meant in the interpretation of being different that anyone, any culture, any region that was different from the then progressive uh, Eurocentric model, that this model was necessarily a regressive one just because it was different. Yet in the past 50 years or so, we started this, there was a paradigm shift because we started celebrating diversity as Congresswoman Frankel has just uh, uh, mentioned a few minutes ago. So we started realizing that the world we were living in and the movement of history is a multi-dimensional one, which means that being different is not necessarily being backwards or being regressive or moving backwards in general. Yet, there are still, Jonathan, traces of that in how we assess and perceive Muslim women in general. Let me give you an example. Muslim-majority countries, such as Pakistan, 
Bangladesh, Indonesia, Kosovo, Mauritius, uh, Sri Lanka, all of them have had more female presidents and prime ministers than countries that we have traditionally considered to be the haven for women's rights, such as France or the United States. Now, I'm not saying here that one country is better than the other or one culture is better than the other. I'm just stating the pure fact that sometimes due to certain stereotypical images or, or a legacy that we have inherited from a previous per period, we sometimes overlook the facts. This does not mean that the reality in the countries that I mentioned, including my own country, is perfect. It just means that when we assess the situation of uh, women and Muslim women uh, specifically, we need to do that assessment through a very complex lens that takes into consideration three main things, historical trajectories, as well as our own biases, all of us as human beings, we have our own biases. And the third element would be pure empirical facts. We need to combine all of these together to make a better informed assessment in general. Thank you so much for that. I'm gonna bring in two questions now because we're running very tight on time. Um, and they're related and they're also related to the question um, from Jennifer that I posed to Jacqueline a minute ago. And I'm gonna direct this one at you, Congresswoman. Um, Jin In, who is the founder of Four Girls uh, Local Leadership, um, thanks you all for uh, being models for women's leadership and asks how you and other leaders are working to develop and support the next generation of women leaders. And Bessie Skouris, who is a former colleague of mine, asks, what are the barriers to running for office that women still face? Um, and what can be done um, officially um, through government programs, uh, uh, civil society and the like, to encourage more women to run for office? And you can spoke, speak, Congressman, woman, both to what's being done in the United States and as Jackie was speaking a minute ago about what can be done to help women abroad. Well, thank you for that question. I just want to make an observation. Isn't it something we have uh, four women from different countries and how uh, similar is our perspective about what's going on in the world? So uh, isn't that something? Because we haven't, I think some of us may have talked before, but I don't, we didn't plan this uh, panel. Uh, so what? He, here's, uh, can, you can see me okay, because my screen sort of uh, got, okay, that's good. Let me just tell you uh, I, uh, on the domestic front from, for myself, I uh, sort of take the lead in a couple of political arenas uh, for the Democrats in the House. I co-chair a uh, the political arm of our, of our Democratic <laughs> Congressional committee is called Women Lead, and we actually focus on recruiting and helping women candidates run for Congress. I also am very involved in a, uh, a PAC founded by many of our Democratic members called Elect Democratic Women, and we literally raise millions of dollars to help those women uh, run for office. So I guess you know, here's the thing, and, and it's, it's sort of a sad kind of thing in politics. And I'd like to see it, uh, changes made, but the real, reality is that uh, pe people need resources, especially to run for Congress. It, it literally takes millions and millions of dollars to get, to get elected to Congress. And so women have to be in a position to be able to uh, raise money. There's a lot of ways, you know, whether you position yourself in the community uh, so people know you and you can pick up the phone and make calls. And there are a lot of groups here. Emily's List is, is a very good example of a very strong national group that has probably every woman in Congress, uh, every Democratic uh, pro-choice woman in Congress has been helped by Emily's List. So uh, th there are a lot of effort and there are smaller groups like that all over the country. Lots, lots of organizing to get women at uh, every level of government here. Uh, in terms of internationally, uh, he, here's just my philosophy. It's women have to be healthy, they have to be educated, 
they have to have access to resources so that they can be economically sustain themselves and their families. And that will make their countries more prosperous or, or their areas that can be more prosperous and more peaceful. That to me is a basic philosophy. And then you go from there. I mean, I think those are really uh, uh, basics. And I, I spend uh, on the, my work that I do, and I spend a lot of time, I'm on the Appropriations Committee in terms of funding issues, is to make sure that we at least send to uh, globally resources, uh, whether it's now, uh, you know, UNFPA, which does a lot of good work. Uh, today, we just, or last week, we once again funded a, a WHO. I mean, we're in sort of, you know, a, a dispute with our president about that, but we try on our appropriations committee to uh, fund these initiatives that are going to help uh, girls and women succeed. Let me ask you now, since we're running uh, hard up against our, our, the end of our hour, um, to, to offer a one or two um, uh, minute closing statement. Um, and Congressman Frankel, I can uh, leave you with a microphone since um, you can just segue from that into any general observations you wanna make at the end of this conversation. Then we'll go to Ambassador Rahmani, Ambassador O'Neill, and uh, uh, Her Excellency uh, Lola al -Khatr. Well, I'm just gonna really sum up what I just said. I, I have a true belief that when women are healthier, girls and women, when they have access to healthcare, uh, that uh, when we uh, try to lessen the dangers that are out there for women whether it, uh, and girls, whether it's child marriage, gentle mutilation, uh, becoming part of terrorist activity or being used uh, in terrorist activity, uh, that when women, when laws are changed in countries uh, where so women can, can have some economic success. And obviously when girls are educated, it's so important, we put them in a position to have much more prominent roles in their society. So, and, and I like to say that when women succeed, uh, the, the world will succeed. Indeed. Ambassador Rahmani. Thank you. Um, my message would be that the world is changing faster than we have imagined. Uh, we are uh, connected by technology and this is what brings us today together with all of our audience. Uh, the pandemics are coming out that we were never prepared for and never probably imagined. Uh, so uh, in, in this situation, uh, depriving our countries, our societies uh, from half of its potential is just shooting ourselves in the foot. So it is time to become more realistic, to accept that uh, women are added value to the society. It is helping everybody to bring that fresh perspective. If everything was so perfect, the world would have been in a different place. It wasn't, it's not. So why not give it a different chance and let women um, have more opportunities, uh, lead. I know it is internalized. I know it is different. We spoke about the difference uh, before, but uh, it is time uh, to get up to speed. Otherwise it is just, we are setting ourselves uh, for uh, not being prepared. And, and we already spoke how women leaders has done differently due to their diversity and whether it was causality or correlation and all of that. But the, the, I, I come back to, to the topic of this discussion on foreign policy uh, that is her power, she can, and you just let it happen. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. Thanks, Jonathan. You know, I, I think the great challenge ahead of all of us right now is to recognize that often what we describe as lessons learned are basically just lessons observed. And without really deliberate attention and focus on rolling them back into our systems, we're at risk of just noting things in this pandemic and then moving forward. And I think 
our collective focus has to be on the Lemonade Project and what we actually systemically need to change. And I wanna put forward just three ideas on that. One is to actually change our definition of security to recognize that all the, the weapons and guns and tanks in the world were not the first tool that we used to protect us from this pandemic, that we actually need to invest in human security. So health systems, digital access, child care, all sorts of things that actually make us secure. We need to secondly collect, routinely collect better data. So this focus right now on disaggregating data, we just can't lose that. And if we can normalize that and make it much more common that we're disaggregating data and that we're looking at, at racial differences, regional, urban, rural, all of these different types of data, we will do so much better. And third, if we actually just continue and invest much more in local organizations, we have to recognize that the agility that various groups needed within to respond to this was so crucial and they have so much more domestic and local credibility and to recognize that we really, really have to keep funneling investments, not just to massive international organizations and institutions and in particularly Western led organizations, but really get much more of our international assistance in the hands of local actors. I think we'll, we'll do much a much better job of ensuring that we're not just observing the challenges of these differences, but learning the lessons and changing as a result. Well said, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Lola, last words. Thank you so much. I'll be very brief, three main points. And the second poll, I was one of the minority that actually voted for more data uh, for the public as the most powerful tool. And my point here was actually more education, more awareness, more knowledge, education, education, education. That is the most powerful tool to empower women. And this is my segue to my second point, that is being qualified. All the beautiful women that um, I'm very honored to be part of, uh, of this discussion with are qualified to be in the positions that they are uh, occupying currently. So being qualified is very important. At a specific point of time, maybe at a specific phase, we might be in need uh, for quotas, et cetera, fair enough, known as uh, uh, maybe positive discrimination, but we need to reach the point of having qualified women in positions. And the uh, third point is about giving women the option. It's not about tailoring a specific role. It's about giving each of us as women the option to choose our path. That's very important as well. And I would like to conclude by thanking the distinguished panelists. I was really honored to be part of this panel and thanking you uh, Jonathan and, and Paul. Thank you. Well, thank. I want to thank you, and I want to thank all of you. Uh, this has been a fascinating conversation, and is clearly just the beginning of a conversation that needs to go on in many, many more fora, but beyond this one. Um, I uh, want to um, thank each of you for participating. You're all inspiring in, in your ways. Um, I want to also thank uh, the Embassy of Qatar for supporting this program. Uh, of ours um, and uh, this effort to focus uh, a spotlight more squarely on, on these issues. Please stay tuned for more virtual events coming up shortly from foreign policy, including tomorrow's discussion of the state of play across the global 5G ecosystem. Please join us virtually in October for our 2020 Her Power Summit. Program details and logistical updates will be available soon at foreignpolicy.com slash events. And finally, I wanna ask you all to please keep reading and please keep subscribing. It's thanks to your support that we're able to do everything that we do and feature great minds like we heard from today. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Take care and we'll see you soon. Goodbye. Thanks, Jonathan. Thank you.